Good morning, folks. Welcome back to uh, our discovery class. Today, we're beginning a new study in the book of Colossians. We are. Yes, it's, we, it's we not discovered. shoes you wear, Colossians, <laughs> Colossians. which I which I slur sometimes to say col Colossians. But we're in the book of Colossians, the Paul, the, the little letter that Paul wrote to the city of Colossae, and uh, we're glad you're with us. Let me pray with us, and then uh, I'll turn it over to, to Carol to to get us jumped into the study in Colossians. God, we do thank you for this day and thank you for the way you care for us, the way you provide for us. And God, we do ask today that as we gather uh, through this video uh, study, uh, that you'll speak through us, uh, you'll speak through Carol and I, and you'll bring a word that not only we need out of, out of your word, but you'll bring a word to the folks that are listening to this, uh, wherever they might be as, as they view this video. And God, as we always pray, may the words of our, how, our mouths and the meditations of our hearts uh, be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. For your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, and I will go ahead and get us started. And then we're, we've are we decided today we're just going to kind of jump back and forth and, and uh, make this rel relevant and make this real. Because if, if it doesn't apply to us today, it's not going to be real. And there's an awful lot in this, John, mm -hmm. that applies yeah. to today, doesn't it? So, Book of Colossians. It was uh, written about uh, 60 A.D., and when was it written? When Paul was in jail in Rome. Now, the interesting thing about this book is, number one, he never has been there. Right. This is not a place he's been to at all. Uh, apparently, Epaphras, who you see in verse 7, must have gone to Paul while he was in jail and said, hey, you know, they're doing this good stuff. And this it reminds me in the beginning, sort of like the uh, beginning of Revelation, where he says to the church, <coughs> you're doing this well, but, oh, but, yeah. you know, you're not doing this well. It's got, it kind of sets up like that in a fatherly way he's doing this. Um, so he's writing to them. So th that's Paul's motivation for doing this. He's in jail and he wants to talk to these people who's never met. But why? That this is part of... It's about three letters that are called written to the reversion. Their people are reverting back to things that, you know, Christ isn't completely God. And, and he's, there's an awful lot going on here that they're trying to weave other things into the beliefs. And um, as John and I were talking earlier, isn't that what our modern day cults do? Is that they take a kernel of truth, but they say, oh, but Jesus isn't really God. Or Jesus isn't really, you know whatever you fill in the blank so this is very relevant today and during back then there were a movement kind of called syncretism which is what gnosticism came out of later on which you for those of you who don't know they they, they take parts of things but it, it this movement was sort of that the spirit is good but matter is bad okay so that's why he spends so much time on christ the man, Christ, the body, Christ, because he's saying, no, he wasn't bad. His body was what did it for us. It's, it's went to the cross to save us. So that's kind of all swirling around here. Plus, these people in Colossus could be thinking, why should we be listening to a guy in prison? Exactly. You know, I mean, yeah. he, he's thrown in jail for what? So that there was some question as to, should we really be listening to this guy? And Paul addresses that too later on in the chapter, and he starts off. He starts off with verses that are a little different from how he starts off other things, because and, and one word I'm going to bring out, and John's going to bring out some other ones. He says, "Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus." Why? Because he wants to show them that he, while not one of the twelve, apostle means to be sent out. He was sent out by God so that he has the right to talk to them whether he is free and movable, like could, could have gone to them, or whether he is locked in prison. So that he, he's building us, even just in the first couple of words of this chapter, he's building his credentials and saying to them, this is why I need you to listen to me. And he's not lauding it over them. He's asking them to listen to him in love. So that that's kind of where it goes. This is an area that was very... Uh, uh, rich in chalk because it was a river delta so they could market that so it was a an area that was uh had a lot of merchants going through it but it was also an area and later on he refers to not changing your beliefs like shifting mm -hmm. it's because this is an area of earthquakes 
big earthquakes and that as John and I talked earlier there are no ruins whatsoever of any Col Colossian church because they believe that after having written this there was a big earthquake and mm -hmm. it kind of swallowed, swallowed it up swallowed the, whole town. swallowed the whole town so it's not like if you've been to Israel one of the big things is to go here and say yes this is the ruin of and you can walk around and you can see where all things happen this that would not be the case for this church which sort of makes me feel too like um isn't it wonderful that Paul's word got to them because some of them might have reverted back and not not have been among those who accepted Jesus as Lord what does that say to us now it there's there's we need to be, this is valid and we need to get with this, particularly in this time of COVID and whatnot. We need to tell people that Jesus is Lord and make it real so that th that kind of takes you to the, the introduction. It's divided it's kind of into two parts. Uh, one through two is kind of what Jesus has done. And then three and four are kind of what we're supposed to do with that and how we're supposed to go. Um, so that th there are two real big portions of chapter one that both John and I love. Nine through 12 is called the prisoner's prayer of how Paul kind of prays over them. Over them. And then the second part is, you know, he was, he was preeminent. He was supreme. And that this is the only place in scripture that that supremacy or preeminence that that word is used. Mm -hmm. But so that it's got some real special stuff in it. I just wanna, before I turn it back over, we're gonna kind of go back and forth today. I just want to bring us to the prisoner's prayer, and that's verses 9 through 12. How do, how do we pray over our loved ones? Mm -hmm. how, does, how did Paul pray over his loved ones? And I just want to see this because he's asking them to pray for insight and wisdom. Now, he's also dealing with kind of these mysterious mm -hmm. cults that are referring back that are said that only they have the answers to mysteries. And Paul is saying, uh-uh, we have the answer. Pray for it. And as in James, it says, if any man lacks wisdom, what should we do? We should pray and go to God and seek it. Not say, well, it's something we can't understand. Jesus Christ stood right there before them. And you, we can understand he was a real man. And he came to really tell us that this is, this is the will of my father. And this is what my father looks like. So understand that the prayer and the praying for this is Paul just bearing his soul and saying you got it you got the wisdom pray for it go for this here and then in the end when he says he reminds them at the end of this that Jesus gave them four things he qualified them to share in their inheritance Jesus said I'm giving it to you. You know, I gave it to you on the cross. You don't need some mystic to tell you how to get it. He said, I, I bought you and I brought you into the kingdom. I, I have loved ones who are not in the kingdom. I, I need them to see this. Um, and he w went on and he rescued them. And then he also says, he gave himself as the redemption for their sins. So, the mystery that these people are buying into, Paul is saying, it's false. Jesus Christ is, yeah, he, he's the mystery of Christ is that he's here. He's real. He died for us and he resurrected. And don't buy into this. Don't buy into the, as John and I were saying, the cult of the neighbors just to the north of us, the Scientologists. Don't buy into this stuff. They're trying to tell you that their way is better. And the only better way that Paul is trying to say to these people he's never met, it's Jesus Christ. So I just wanted to establish that, that what he's trying to come against here before I turn it back over to John, because um, there's some really neat stuff in this. So it, take it later on, and, and, and I do do a printout each time, So and, and I send it on to John, and some people have asked for it, and I send it on if you want it. Let John know, and he sure. can let me know, and we can send it on to you easily. But um, yeah. take it away, Mister. Well, thank you, Carol. And, and it it it's such a an interesting little letter that Paul wrote, and and as as Carol said, it it's sadly um, historically um, not only did the did the this if there was a church building get swallowed up in the earthquake, 
um, from archaeologists, the, the entire town was swallowed up. There's, mm -hmm. there's very little evidence of actually being able to pinpoint where Colossae right. was, kind of like right. you could pinpoint on a map where St. Petersburg is. You really can't do that right. because uh, of the earthquakes that happened around there. So, so it is an interesting letter, and, and, as, and as Carol said, Paul hadn't visited it. He, he was just writing to them. And, um, and, and so let's just kind of jump into it and see, and see what it has to say. Carol brought out that Paul writes from the very beginning. He, he establishes himself as an apostle, one that had been uh, with Jesus, one who was established as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the very will of God. Uh, that Paul's just not some guy in prison or some guy out there telling him what to do, encourage him in the faith, trying to give him some instructions. He's saying, you know, I, I am writing this because God has placed me here to write this. I am an apostle. And he refers to Timothy, uh, a, a servant of the church that Paul, again, writes mm -hmm. to, probably the same Timothy that Paul wrote to in First mm -hmm. and Second Timothy, and this letter is addresses a lot of the same issues. Exactly. Yeah. So that it, that would make perfect sense. Sorry. No, you're fine. Cut you're in. Fine. <laughs> you can cut in any time. <laughs> I will. I will. I will be quiet. Uh, oh in. wow! I better <laughs> cut in more often, huh? <laughs> but then, he, but then in verse two, he says to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Uh, just a couple of things there, and and, and again. Uh, just to defining some words, some of your Bibles at that point may have saints, and uh, mm -hmm. and the word really is holy ones, and and it's the same word written in the Septuagint in the in the Greek version of the Old Testament, where the writers of the Septuagint refer <clears throat> refer to the household of God, refer to the people that are dwelling with God. There was this imagery uh, of God had had this had this realm of of creation that is in the heavens mm -hmm. and then God is you know the story of Eden that God wanted humanity to be part of his family and so he created Adam and Eve to build a human family to represent his heavenly family mm -hmm. that he had and and that's where we are created in the image of God we we are presented as God's family on earth and then of course we sin we rebel do we we broke away, and the rest of the story, you know. Um, but but here, but here, Paul is saying to those of us who are believers, you've been restored to that holy family. You're holy ones. Your your saints does not really kind of carry mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. Saints does not really carry the weight of what Paul is actually referring to. Because when when I think of saints, I think of those people who were martyred for the faith. Those people. Um, but 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 it, that kind of lived the exemplary exemplary life of a of a believer at the turn of the century and throughout the ages, but that's really not what Paul is saying in in the word holy ones. He's re, he's really saying we're part of the family of God, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's that's so much bigger than saints to me. And so I wanted to kind of point that out. He's saying to the holy ones, to those people who are part of the family of God, to the to the to the Always. faithful brethren in Christ and. And, and again, here, um, you know, he's talking about men and women. Mm -hmm. just, can we just say that? Mm -hmm. he, you know, some of your Bibles may have brothers and sisters, or, but my, the NIV just has the brothers in Christ. Obviously, Paul was not saying, I'm only talking to the men at Colossae. He's obviously talking to the women. And, uh, and, and, and I think we just have to realize that there are some places in the Scripture where it, it's okay to be gender neutral. You know, these, these letters that are the reversion letters, which are Galatians, Ephesians, and Colossians, the three letters that are, he's really writing to those groups to say, hold firm. He, of course, always says to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ, mm -hmm. and, and Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ <laughs> means, well, some people think that. That's I used true. to think that. That's true. <laughs> um, that it's Jesus, the Messiah. He's reminding Jews this is the guy. Don't revert back from it. We found him. Why are you letting him go? So I just needed yeah. to no. bloody trail that in. No, good point. Good point. All right, so let's go on to verse 3. Uh, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. They're, they're, they're uh, what, what Carol said, referencing, referencing um, who Jesus is in compared to God. We give yep. thanks to, to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, Paul making the point that that Jesus is 
close to God, that Jesus is God, Yahweh's son, the, the son of God. And, and we'll reference that again not in a moment. Not just an angel. Not yes, just uh -huh. an angel, not just another dude, yeah. that, that he right. is the Christ. And when we pray for you, because and and when we we always give thanks when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus mm -hmm. again ringing that bell and and the love you have for all the saints the faith and love that spring up from the hope that is stored in you that is stored for you in heaven that and that you have already heard about in the word of truth the gospel that has come to you so all that's one big sentence where Paul says I'm thanking God Mm -hmm. uh, that we've heard of your faith and your faith and love that springs from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven. Again, back to the holy ones. You're part of the family of God. This, mm -hmm. this total experience you're going to experience as part of the family of God. You're experiencing it now, but there's a hope for you one day that you're going to experience it fully. And you've already heard this word of truth, mm -hmm. the gospel. He identifies what the word of truth is. He, that mystery that he's going to talk about later, mm -hmm. there he identifies it again. The gospel that has come to you all over the world. Now, um, obviously, at this point, Paul is is speaking expansively because it's 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 not really at the time Paul wrote this all over the world. It's just kind of expanding out. But he was in Rome quite a ways away. But yeah. he was. Uh -huh. it, but yeah. the the world as he knew it. Exactly. The world as he yeah. knew it. It's all yeah. over the known mm -hmm. world. And of course, now the gospel is still spreading all over the world. It's amazing to think that there are unreached people groups still in our world that have never even heard the word of the gospel. And so uh, that the gospel is continuing to spread. And bearing fruit. And like bearing says, fruit. Bearing fruit. Because, uh, you know, the point he's going to start making now is if, if you revert back and if you, if you don't claim Jesus is who he is, what kind of fruit are you bearing here? Right. So that, that he's working this all in that your actions and your deeds have results. So I, I like oh. that. I like we're starting positively, but he's going to zing them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, all over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it's been doing so among you since the first day you heard it and you understood God's grace in all and in, in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, there he is. a fellow yeah. servant who is a faithful minister of the gospel. Uh, on our behalf and who who told us about your love in the spirit and so you can see in this this first eight verses paul um raises high the 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 image of god the image of jesus and then brings in the holy spirit here mm -hmm. at the end mm -hmm. and talking about the gospel kind of this whole nutshell of, of this is why we're excited to hear about what's going on in Colossae because we've heard from Epaphras that the gospel is growing, you're bearing fruit, you're doing all the appropriate things that a group of believers are supposed to be doing, and we're so excited for you. But he's also established Epaphras as like the ambassador. Right. You know, he's, he's they, the people at Colossians know now probably that Epaphras probably went to Paul in prison, right. that he met with Paul in prison, he told Paul the good, the bad, and the ugly, and he's coming back, and Paul is saying, this is my guy. Listen to him. Believe what he says to you, because I'm charging him now to come back to speak to you, because I, Paul, can't do that. Right. So I like the fact that he is, you know, Paul is so bright. We need to just see how he establishes in the same way that he kind of did in Philemon. You know, he's now a son of mine and in Christ and welcome him back. And, you know, he, he's real good at what he does here, but he's establishing it for their good. He's going, he's going yeah. somewhere. Yeah, he's he going is. somewhere he with is. this. And then, and then, so that's all the intro that Paul wrote. And then he goes into what, what Carol mentioned, referenced a few minutes ago that he prays for the people. And he's, and he says for this reason, and he, he's been praying for him and he, and he goes into this, the next few verses of telling the folks, here's what I've been praying for you about. As I as I pray for you unceasingly, not as I pray for you all the time, here's, here's what I pray for you. And he says, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God, here you go, to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Uh, and, and, and again, as Carol referenced, these people are talking about there's this special knowledge that you can get from angels. And if you follow these teachings over here that we're talking about, you'll get this special knowledge and this, this mystical understanding of Judaism and these, these beginning notions of, of Gnosticism. And Paul's like, no, 
He says, I'm praying that you have a, a knowledge that comes from God, that you will be filled with the knowledge of his will. This is not a secret knowledge. This is a knowledge that you can get by reading the word, by reading the scriptures, by reading the scriptures they have, and by listening to Epaphras and your teachers, and by hearing me as an apostle of, of Jesus, Paul says, that, that we're praying that you're going to be filled with the knowledge of the truth Amen. and have all and have all spiritual wisdom and, and it's, it's spiritual wisdom and understanding. And, and that those two phrases go together. That that spiritual wisdom and understanding, or spiritual understanding and wisdom, can be found throughout the Old Testament, referring to that to that insight that comes from God. Wisdom comes from God. Spiritual understanding comes from God. It, it, the grammatically, it could go either way. It could go spiritual understanding and wisdom, or it could go spiritual wisdom and understanding. The the spiritual goes with the phrase, and so. Paul's saying, I, I want you to be filled with the knowledge of God that springs up these things that grow in your life. You were about to say something. Yeah, and what, what I want to say is, how, how is it easy to rope somebody in? Is to say to them, oh, come here, I'm going to tell you something you don't know. Let me let me convey to you some new knowledge, something right. new, and your your ears kind of perk up. I'll never forget one time I was having conversation with a Jehovah's Witness, and I was kind of going back and forth and I was trying to listen and when I made a point that the person did not know how to refute she said I'm just so sorry you're so confused you just don't understand but see I understand she said to me because I have the knowledge of Jehovah so what she was trying to do was get me to doubt and that's what these people who gotten in with them have said you don't you don't understand but we have this mysterious knowledge, and Paul is saying to him, no, anybody can have it if they just turn to Jesus Christ. So right. just, again, the whole thing that these cults, to the modern-day cults, this is not just something that was only relevant back then. They're good at taking a kernel and doing, doing that now. So think about this as if you're talking with somebody who believes differently than you. Yeah, and, and, and allow me to just expand on that. I don't think it's just talking about those big, scary right, cults. Exactly. You know, we're not, you know, Paul's not talking about here, well, he is talking mm -hmm. about here, mm -hmm. you know, people that are trying to bring untrue theology or unfounded theology into the church at Colossae, but he's talking about bringing something in that supersedes Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so we got to think, what is something that can be brought in that supersedes Jesus, and and I'm getting way ahead of myself here. But let's just go ahead and draw the parameters. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Paul is encouraging us, as Carol has brought out. Yes, Paul is encouraging us to be careful about the teachings of cult, the major cult groups out there in the world that that try to diminish this the the, the placement of Jesus in our theology. But, but I think Paul's also talking to us within the church at First Baptist St. Petersburg that says that, that, that when somebody tries to slip in that understanding of, you know, it's really not worship unless the organ is played. Mm -hmm. I understand. You know, we really can't worship unless we meet in the building. Yep. You know, we really can't have a Bible study unless we're sitting around in a circle close to one another. You know, this whole mentality that that it really isn't a spiritual worship service or we really aren't having church, as Paul calls us, unless we're doing it the way that I've always done it, which puts my beliefs and positions above what Jesus wants to do. And so I think we got to be real careful and say, Paul's not just talking about those big scary cults out there. Paul's talking to us about anything we do that replaces Jesus as the supreme focus of what we're all about. Mm -hmm. And I think we're all guilty of oh, that. Absolutely. We're all guilty of saying, you know, you know, where, where somebody else would say, you know, it's not really worship unless the organ's played. I would say it's not really worship until you have three or four electric guitars going wild, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, we have, <laughs> we have this stroke. But, but the, the point is, no, if we're exalting Jesus, that's what we're supposed to be about. And anything that clouds that, Paul is saying, be careful. That's why he's talking so much about the knowledge of God and who Jesus is. And let's remember who Jesus is. Because these people are coming in, 
you know, not saying, ooh, there's this big scary cult that's next door to the Church of Colossae. No, he's saying there's people inside your community that are diminishing the role of Jesus, mm -hmm. and we can't do that. Mm -hmm. Stop doing that. Don't listen to them. Listen to Paphras. He's the one that's going to guide the truth. And so so I, I think, you know, it's not, we've got to kind of be clear about, I, I, that's how I view what he's saying. So then he goes back. Let's just kind of run through this prayer because we're getting out of time here. We've still got a long way to go. <laughs> We talked about maybe making this first chapter two weeks, and it may turn into that. <laughs> anyway, let me just say, he prays. He, let me just kind of hit the highlights of this prayer. He prays that you'll be filled with knowledge. He'll, he prays that you live a life worthy of the calling of God, that, that, that worthy of the Lord, and that you can please him in every way. And, and, and Paul says, and here's how you please him. You please him by bearing fruit goes back to what we talked about a couple of weeks ago in John chapter 15. You please him by bearing fruit. You please him by growing in the knowledge of him. There that is, that understanding of who Jesus is. And you please him by being strengthened, strengthened in your faith so that you can endure, so that you can have patience, and that you can joyfully give thanks. I mean, that's just kind of wrapping a ribbon around the whole thing. And then he says something that Carol referenced a few minutes ago. And, and what do what does he want to, what does Paul pray that I can joyfully give thanks for? He says, I want you to be able to joyfully give thanks um, that that he has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints. There's that word again, the holy ones, that you may be able to share in the inheritance of the holy ones in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light. Of the son he loves and, and i'm just going to pause here for a moment that word inheritance such an interesting word um I, a lot of the folks that i read about talk about that that's an old testament word and when we look back in the old testament we got to wonder who what is the inheritance he's talking about is it the inheritance of of land is it the inheritance of pro property and i think if you go back to deuteronomy Ooh, there's a Carol usually the ones takes us back to the Old Testament. I'm gonna take us back to the Old Testament. News today. flash, John's going backwards. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses eight and nine, it says, When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, and he divided up all mankind, and he set up boundaries for the people according to the number of the sons of Israel, for the Lord's portion is his people, and Jacob is his allotted inheritance. Uh, after the Tower of Babel, God broke up all the nations, and he divided lines, and he divided language, and he says, I reserved Israel for my inheritance. Israel is my portion. Israel is my special people. There's other gods, and there's other languages out there. I'm going to divide them up, and, and they can have those countries, but I am the one true God. I am above all those gods. And so then Paul brings us back, in, Col in Colossians and said that he has he has qualified you. Who's the you he's talking about? He's talking to the Gentiles. He's talking to the Gentiles and he's reminding the Jews. He's reminding the Jews and he's talking to the Gentiles. He says, God has qualified us, qualified you to share in that inheritance, that God, that, that reality that God chose the, the Israel nation for his special portion, for his special people. And, and Paul is coming here and saying, refer, the, the Jews knew that. They knew what he was talking about. The Gentiles were kind of surprised. But we're part of that inheritance. We're part of God saying, you are my people. Mm -hmm. Which is the good news, the mystery that Paul talks about later in the book of Colossians, that all this is happening to include all the nations as his special people. So he qualified us. He gave us the, 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 the rights and the responsibility to share in the inheritance of the Holy Ones in the kingdom of light, in that kingdom of God that God has talked about. And in verse 34, he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. That, that's, to, to me, this is one of my favorite passages. I think it's hard to say in the New Testament, but, but it, one of my favorite passages that speaks to me because it says to me what Jesus has done for me that he has rescued me from the dominion of darkness. Um, I, I, I spent some time as, as a, a young man, as, as a lifeguard on the beach and, and, and as a pool lifeguard, kind of how I made money in high school and doing that kind of stuff. 
And a couple of times I had to rescue somebody from a, a, a riptide in the ocean, or I had to, to pull them out of, of the pool. And, 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 and the, the, the complete distraught on those people's faces and, and, and the flailing that they were doing when I was able to be involved in that opportunity to rescue them from a peril. I think maybe that's why this means so much because it's saying I was stuck. I was, I was unable to get out of the dominion of darkness. I was unable to get out of the grasps of Satan, of the sin in my life. But he rescued me. Nothing that I did on myself. He, he grabbed me and pulled me out, which is literally what I did one time. I just have to say, I was sitting there beside the pool and I looked down and I saw this little bob of hair floating by me. And this little buddy was, it was struck. And I literally, I just reached out and grabbed him by the hair and pulled him out of the water. He was just a little fellow. But, but, but that image sticks with me that that's what Jesus has done for us. He's rescued us from the dominion of darkness, from utter failure and plucked us out and placed us into the kingdom of the son he loves. That's just cool. It is cool, but I, I just also want to back us up for a minute. He's speaking to Gentiles, as John said. But think about if you were a Jew, you were God's chosen people. You were told all the way along that Judaism was it, you know, and you had one God in this. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, it's... All these Gentiles are now being let into the kingdom under this new man who you've accepted. They've accepted Jesus as Messiah. It, it would be sort of like if you were an only child mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden your parents adopted 10 kids and said, we love them just as much as that you, they have all the rights of inheritance that you have. This is... This was a rocky road for some of these Jews. And I don't want us to miss that, that they're still struggling with, so we really let these guys in? Oh, you know? sure. And, and that maybe that's why they're reverting back. And, and should we really, and I guess we do it, you know, do, sure. do Baptists believe what Presbyterians believe or do Methodists or should, are they really here or Catholics or whatnot? No, the foundation is Jesus Christ. And I think he's also talking to that a little bit because he's also saying to the, the true Jewish brothers in here and sisters, you know, I love all. The, the, the thing I didn't bring out is that in this book of Colossians, the word all is used 30 times. It's one of the most used words in this because he's saying this is for all all we're not mysterious we're not anything about that and it's not just jews or gentiles <coughs> we're all the children of Christ, of god of, of children of god brothers and sisters of christ and so this this whole heritage and inheritance thing it's tough for some of these people to understand and and i get that mm -hmm. but paul is still hammering home that message that we still need to hammer home today. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord, you're in his kingdom. Mm -hmm. yes. Thanks, Carol. I, I think, you know, and, and let me just read the, the, the next couple of verses, and then, and then we're going to pause and, and pick it up next week. Um, He's going to extend this beyond four <sighs> weeks, guys. Here we go. See, I'm having an effect on you. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's so good. I, I don't want to rush through it because the, the next... It's too good. It's, it's good stuff, but I'm going to read this, and I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to say this. The next section from verses 15 uh, to 21. It's one, some of my favorite sections yeah. of Scripture, so hear the Word of God. 15, well, 15 to 21. Yeah. There are 10 things that Paul underscores about who Jesus is. Yes. And remember we said before, there's this there's this belief that Paul was dealing with that was that 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 and he and he references angels and he references this Jewish mysticism this that 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 was going on in the in the, in the church at Colossae. Uh, he references it, but but his point is that Jesus is not just another angel. No. Jesus is not just another heavenly being. Jesus is somebody special. And in the next few verses, he lists out. Ten things that proves 
who, to the, to who Jesus is. And I'm just going to read them, and then we're going to stop, and we're going to pick it up next week. I'm going to give you a week to read through this section and, and see and if you can find... And all you can. Yes, yeah. if, see if you can find all all of the, 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 the things that Paul says about Jesus in just these next verses, and Carol wants you to circle all the alls. But here, <laughs> here, here it is, that he is the image, starting in verse 15. He, Jesus, speaking of Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn and of all. And stop right there. On firstborn, I want you to make a little note. Read this week, Psalm 89, 27 through 28, and see how this ties in. There okay. you go. I interrupted you him see, again. Sorry. It's, there's so much. We can't <laughs> We're just... getting excited here. <laughs> he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, were there thrones or powers or rulers or authorities? All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the, among the dead, so that everything, he, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And there we're going to stop because that is so much there that I think we need to understand in our lives today, not just the folks that were living in Colossae. We need to understand that Jesus is supreme over all things. And anything that I put above Jesus I am diminishing who Jesus is. Absolutely. And we can't. And I was listening the other day to a talk show saying that's the hard thing about in this culture about dealing with money because money is important that you can make it almost that money can be people's God. Money is necessary. Money can protect. Money can buy good health care. Money can all the things that God's the provider and God's the thing. It, it's so easy for people to slip into saying but my God is money. But in this, he's saying, no, Jesus is the firstborn, the preeminent. He's it. And so, he, yes, he's addressing, as John said, to the church then. But if this were ever relevant, it's relevant now. Amen. It, 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 and, and, and maybe not only read that, but think this next week, what are some areas yeah. in my life? Not just the big cult things or not just the big scary money but what are the things literally in my life today that have more importance to me yeah. or that are preeminent over the person of who Jesus is? And I think that's what Paul's challenging me on and saying, John, you're, you're putting your family in front of Jesus. John, you're putting, you're putting your job. You're more concerned about your job, you know, doing a good job than you are about serving Jesus. And I think, you know, we got to think about those things because I think, the church is in the state that it's in today because we've put things above Jesus. And that's what that's what he's calling us back to. So with that, we'll leave you. Be safe out there. Be wise. Wear your mask. Hope to see you on Sunday, November the 1st. Yeah, yeah. And uh, be the church. Be the church. Know that on the 1st, we'll be giving a lot of virtual hugs. Virtual high fives. Yeah, six <laughs> feet away. God bless you.